Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Giving the presentation this evening will be our club historian, David Mostardi. In the last time he talked, which was two years ago, he gave a presentation about the history of the club. This is really the history of Berkeley and, it, and how Berkeley was important in that time and its formative years. So without further ado, I'll introduce my husband, David Mostardi. Thank you, Arlene, for that kind introduction. So it is a pleasure to see you all here during the club on our birthday week. Uh, this coming Friday, the 5th of October, is the 120th anniversary of the very first Hillside Club meeting. And so because that happened in 1898, I wanted to talk about 1898. So let's take a look at Berkeley about 1898. So here's the university here. It's looking very grand with its two big buildings. Um, and there's a garden over here and uh, drilling grounds. There's a gymnasium, there's a library. You see there are lots of houses here in this area between Telegraph and Grove, what, what's now MLK. Uh, um, there are uh, some more houses here. This is the Ocean View industrial area down here. But there are lots of green space in the middle, what used to be farms where we still were farms at the time. And there's this whole area here, which is where all the dormitories are at Cal right now, just a big green empty space. But our story takes place a few blocks over to the right. <clears throat> so this is ground zero for the Hillside Club. This is the north side area, and this photograph was taken in 1898, the year the club was founded. <clears throat> And what I'd like you to do is to focus on this building right here. Um, and if, if you look carefully, you can see uh, the uh, stepped gables right here, the Cape Dutch stepped gables. This building uh, was where the very first meeting of the Hillside Club happened 120 years ago this Friday. And I'm going to go ahead and say that this very day this photograph was taken, that was the day that meeting was happening. I have. I have no evidence whatsoever for that claim, but we're going to say the day this little boy was gambling about in the hills, that was the day right now that meeting is happening in this building, this building that was called the most beautiful building in all of Berkeley. And here is the most beautiful building in Berkeley. It was the house of Volney Moody, um, and he gave it a Dutch name, Veldvreden. I don't know how they... The Moody's pronounced this word because they weren't Dutch, but in Dutch they say Veldvreden, which means well-satisfied. It was a, a common name for houses back then. And this building was so beautiful they made postcards of it. So you see, uh, this is a postcard of this building. Uh, sad to say this building does not look like this today. That's, this is how it looks today. Yeah, I know, it's very sad. Um, it, 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 it is a long story, I won't go into the story, but uh, this building is at the corner of Leroy and LeConte, so just up here, a couple of blocks. And the woman who got the club started in 1898, her name was Margaret Robinson, Madge to her friends. Uh, she was married to the photographer Oscar Maurer, and she was in a perfect position to start the Hillside Club. She was wealthy, she was smart. Uh, she also had a weakness for really fancy hats, like the one you see her. Uh, all the pictures of Madge Robinson uh, have her wearing hats like this. And she was very, very well socially connected. And Madge, uh, as Arlene intimated, Madge and her cohorts had a mission. And I'm gonna tell you that mission a little later because I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's, I told you we we're gonna talk about 1898. So let's take a look at 1898. So here is 1898 riding in on her pretty bicycle and posies are falling out of her basket while the old, tired, uh, old lady 1897 rides away. This is a centerfold from Puck Magazine in 1898. If I had to pick one word, my light motif for this evening, that word is change. 1898 and the years before and the years after were a time of great social and technological change and very fast social and technological change. 
So the first thing to remember about 1898 was 1898 was a long, long time ago. Now, we're used to thinking of the signing of the Declaration of Independence as ancient history, as ancient as history gets in the United States. But in 1898, the Declaration of Independence was just as far back in history as 1898 is to us today. The way to think about it is that the Hillside Club is exactly half as old as the United States. So we go back halfway to this very ancient time. So 120 years, that's a long time. In 1898, the American Civil War had just ended 33 years before. So if you were a Californian from somewhere back east, and most Californians back then were transplants from back east, um, and you were, say, age 50, or a little older, then the American Civil War was a huge thing in your personal life experience. And if you were a man who was age 50 or older in 1898, then you were probably a Civil War veteran. You probably saw combat. And if you were just a little older than that, say if you were about age 70 and you lived here in California, well, you might well have come out for the gold rush which happened 50 years before that in 1848. Well, that's when gold was discovered. That was another period when change in California happened extraordinarily quickly. Uh, between, 19, between 1848 and 1853, in just a five-year span, the non-Native American population of California grew from 2,000 to 300,000 in five years. So let's take a look at what was happening around these parts in 1898. So on the 1st of January, New Year's Day, 1898, uh, New York City, which used to be just Manhattan Island here in purple, annexed uh, four other counties in, uh, to create greater New York City, making it all of a sudden the second largest city in the whole world uh, after London in the UK. Uh, just two weeks after that, the French author Émile Zola published J'accuse, in which he accused the French government of anti-Semitism in the Dreyfus Affair. About that same time, H.G. Wells published War of the Worlds, one of my personal favorites when I was a boy, um, about Martians coming to attack the Earth. And about that same day, the USS Maine sails into Havana Harbor in Cuba. That's the Maine coming into the harbor. Uh, and just a few weeks later, on February 15th, the main exploded. That's the wreckage down there on the bottom. The explosion was probably caused by a coal fire that ignited the ammunition magazines, but the US press played it up and said, oh no, it was a mine, it was an act of war. Um, and this precipitated the Spanish-American War. A few weeks after that, this woman, whose name was Phoebe Ann Mosey, but better known to you and me by her stage name of Annie Oakley, she wrote a letter to the President of the United States offering the government the services of a company of 50 lady sharpshooters who would bring their own arms and their own ammunition in case war should break out with Spain. Um, war did break out with Spain a few weeks afterwards, but the President did not accept her offer. On July 4th in 1898, the United States annexed the Kingdom of Hawaii. And this photograph is from August, when the Hawaiian flag was lowered uh, at Iolani Palace in Honolulu. Most Hawaiians did not accept the legitimacy of this event. Uh, there are still a lot of Hawaiians that don't recognize the legitimacy of that event. Also in June, the second convention of Peking was signed, and a 99-year lease was created between the Qing Dynasty of China and the United Kingdom, giving the British full jurisdiction over Hong Kong. And in December, uh, uh, Pierre and Marie Curie announced the discovery of the element radium to the French Academy of Sciences. So let's take a look at some names and faces, also in the news. So these were some notable people that died in 1898. So on the left, we have Charles Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, the English writer. Um, and in the middle, that's Otto von Bismarck, the Prussian statesman and the first chancellor of Germany. And on the right, that is Aubrey Beardsley, the English illustrator. So died in 1898. 
And here are some people that were born in 1898. So clockwise, from the upper left, that's George Gershwin, the musician. Uh, in the middle, we have the American stage and silent film actress, Dorothy Gish. Uh, then that's Dutch artist M.C. Escher and Belgian artist René Magritte. And then in the lower left, of course, that is Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir. Now some uh, political leaders. I'm sure you recognize the man on the left, and I know you recognize him because his face appears on the $500 bill that is in your wallet right now. Um, this, of course, is the President of the United States in 1898, and his name is Kid Calvin, this is not Calvin Coolidge, no. This, this is William McKinley, President of the United States in 1898. Um, and three years later in 1901, he was shot and killed in Buffalo, New York, uh, succeeded by Teddy Roosevelt. The man in the middle is the Prime Minister of Canada in 1898. That is Wilfrid Laurier. And on the right, rounding out the leaders of North America, that is the president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz. But none of these men were the most famous world leader in 1898. The most famous world leader was a woman, this woman, Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, Empress of India, uh, still on the throne in her 61st year. Uh, she became queen in 1837. So I will be very, very impressed if you know who this man is. Uh, this is the governor of the state of California in 1898. Uh, his name is James H. Budd, B-U-D-D. -D. I had never heard of him either. Um, he was the last Democrat to hold the governorship until 1939. And this man was uh, not the mayor of Berkeley, because Berkeley wasn't a city yet, but he was the president of the Berkeley, ta uh, Berkeley Town Board of Trustees. His name is John Richards. So Berkeley didn't have a mayor until 1909. So in the blurb that I wrote for this talk, you may have seen the blurb, I, I asked a number of rhetorical questions about Berkeley, and this is one of the questions I asked. So was Berkeley a sleepy little sleepy little backwater in the shadow of San Francisco, or was it this growing college town with visions, even delusions of grandeur? And the answer, of course, is yes. So let's take a look, and I remember I'm talking about change this talk, let's take a look at how things are changing. Um, so the United States population in 1898, we're gonna use the 1900 census because it's convenient, the population of the United States in 1900 was 76 million, a little more. Uh, and now, again, the most recent census, 2010, 309 million. So that's four-fold growth in the country's population in those 110 years. But if we look at how California grew during that time, it's much more drastic. California's population went from one and a half million to 37 million in those same 110 years. That's a 25-fold increase. It's a whole lot of infrastructure to be building. So now let's go down and look at Berkeley's population. I'm gonna give you a few more data points. So in 1880, hardly anybody lived here at all, 2,000 people, and probably most of those were students and faculty at the university. But 10 years later, that population basically tripled and in 19, by 1910, excuse me, by 1900, it had tripled again. And by 1910, it had tripled again. And you'll notice, Berkeley's population now is basically the same as it was in 1950. We ran out of room. We couldn't really grow anymore. So if we compare uh, Berkeley in 1898 to when Berkeley ran out of room, that's about a ninefold increase in just 50 years. And if we allow ourselves to compare Berkeley's population in 1880, that's 60 fold increase. So again, a whole lot of infrastructure to be built in a very short amount of time. Enough with the numbers, let's look at some pictures. So this is Berkeley in 1874. There's nothing here except these two brand new shiny university buildings. This is the bay. This is 
Mount Tamalpais over here. So we're in the hills looking west. This is Albany Hill. Okay, this is South Hall, this is North Hall. So this, this is Strawberry Creek here. God. This is the same view in the same year, 1874. You can't see San Francisco is about over here right now, okay? So we're looking basically out. This is where the Golden Gate would be if we could see the Golden Gate. Um, so these two buildings, this is South Hall. South Hall still exists, the oldest building on campus and probably the third oldest building in the city of Berkeley right now, um, 1873. North Hall was also built in 1873, but North Hall was torn down in the 1930s. So as you can see, there's nothing here. Uh, but this, so this is 1874. This is 1900, so 25 years later. So here's a comparison, the two photos side by side. So we've gone from basically nothing up here. These are farms, actually farms. Um, and the little farms that are left are these little green spaces here. So a whole lot changing very quickly. Another question I asked in my blurb, <laughs> people still get around in horses and buggies in 1898. Well, yeah, yes, they did. Um, so this is, this is the university looking the other direction, right? So this picture before, we're up in the hills looking down, and now this next picture with the horse and buggies here looking the other way. Horse-drawn carriages were a fact of life in 1898. Now, whether you owned a horse and buggy depended on several things. Right? How much money you had, right? Uh, how much you needed to get around, whether you lived downtown, maybe you lived next to a streetcar line and you didn't need to uh, have a horse because you could just get on a streetcar and go where you needed to go. Or whether you lived way up in the hills, and we're gonna see some pictures of that, and lots of dirt roads up to that house, and so you, you, streetcars didn't go there yet, so well, you probably did have a horse. And so in 1898 and the years before, if you were going out on a nice family outing, you'd probably go like this. And you would be wearing these nice outfits, yeah, but these outfits over here that Diane Eyre has put out, you'd be wearing something like that. You can see these ladies have very nice hats. Um, so they're out on their carriage on a nice family outing. But 10 or 20 years later, you'd go out on that outing like this. You'd still wear a nice outfit, but you'd take the car. A lot of people didn't have cars or horses because cars and horses were expensive. Uh, now, on a nice day, carrying this basket around maybe isn't so bad. On a cold winter day when it's raining, uh, it's a different story. Again, at the time of huge social and technological change, but there, there were, in 1898, there were whole industries built up around the horse. So first thing, your horse had to eat, and so you had to buy hay and grain for your horse. So you went to businesses like this to get coal, to get food for your horse. And you'd probably get coal while you're at it because you needed to heat your house. Your horse needed a place to live, so you had a stable. Sometimes your horse got sick, so you needed a large animal veterinarian. Your, you had a wagon and a carriage for your horse to pull, and so there were men to build your wagon and to fix your wagon and to paint your wagon. There were blacksmiths to shoe your horse and to repair the metal pieces of your carriage and your wagon when they broke. And in the years between 1895 and 1915, all of this just disappeared. All of these men, and they were, they were mostly men, they, they were all out of work, all to be replaced by the horseless carriage gas stations, mechanics. Now, what, what would we call this today? The, the slang word today is disruption. Um, so if you were a blacksmith, yeah, yeah, you were being disrupted. But yeah, disruption is just a fancy word for competition. Cars were competing against the horses, and the cars won. Were the streets even paved? So let's go back to our comparison between Old Berkeley and New Berkeley. Um, it's hard enough up here even to see a street. It's just fields. Now, there were streets here. Uh, the, the main streets that were running north-south, 
Um, so they were hidden by these trees, but they're down here. I mean, there was a downtown Berkeley. Um, and you can, now, you can see a lot more streets here. This is, uh, this is probably university here, this thick street. Um, so whether the street was paved is going to depend on the, which street are you talking about and which year are we talking about, because things were changing really quickly. So here's a picture of downtown Berkeley. I love this picture. Um, 1892. This is the, believe it or not, this is the intersection of Shattuck and University. The university is a lot narrower than it. And you can tell the streets are not paved right here because of these wooden sidewalk duck boards here. And the reason for those duck boards are so that when it's raining, you can walk on the wood and you won't get your nice shoes all muddy. And in fact, it's raining right now. It's pouring rain, and you notice that nobody is out in the pouring rain and the mud today. But doesn't this picture look more like the Wild West than the home of the State University of California? And this is 1892. But just a few years later, so this picture just went around the Baja website, so I, I, I stole it for his talk. This is a young Cal co-ed, just arrived it looks like in town, and she's um, right downtown at the train station at, uh, on Shattuck, uh, right around Center Street. In fact, these buildings here, this is where the Wells Fargo Tower is at Center and Shattuck. Now, these streets were almost certainly paved at this point, even though we see some horses and carriages there. But let's go back and look at our Ground Zero Northside District of uh, the Hillside Club. This is Hearst Street here, coming up the hill. And this is Ridge Road here. And this is Euclid, going sideways. And this is the, uh, the drill grounds of the university. Uh, the North and South Hall are off to the left out of this picture. So those streets look at least graded. Hard to tell if they're paved or not, at least graded. But this dirt road right here, this would eventually become LeConte Street. And this dirt road right here would become Virginia. And this dirt road right here would become Leroy. So clearly, some of these streets are, are in better shape than others. So this is a close-up here. I want to focus, let's just, for example, we'll focus on this house right here. This house is at the corner of Dirt Road and Dirt Road. Um, okay, it's at the corner of Virginia and Leroy. Um, so it's just dirt, dirt road. So if it rains, it's muddy. And if it's wintertime, it's dark and it's muddy. This is why people had horses and wagons. Now, it, it, this was the up and coming desirable neighborhood. You know, lots of faculty and other university uh, employees worked, uh, wanted to live up here. Um, if we look carefully, we can see evidence of some more modern conveniences. Um, it's, it's hard to see. There are some electrical poles here, telephone poles. There's one here, and there's one here, and there's one here, and there's one here. They're hard to see. So th there is some electricity up here, so probably these, these houses had some electricity, but just for lights, right, there's no such thing as electric refrigerator. You had an icebox. There's no such thing as an electric washing machine you washed your clothes by hand, or you took them down to the laundry. Uh, they would have had indoor plumbing, but at this point, it's gonna be on septic. Those, the sewers hadn't come up here yet. Um, and there's probably no underground gas service either, so you probably were either heating your house with wood fires or with coal. But uh, there's electricity. But one mile north of here, just one mile north of here, it looks like this. Um, actually, you know this area. This is spruce. And this rock right here, this is Grotto Rock, um, which is on Santa Barbara. So Marin, what's now Marin comes up like this and comes up like here. This little dirt track here is Cragmont, or what would become Cragmont. So we can see that development is probably coming, but right now there's just this one house. This is about where Cragmont School is right now. I promised you a movie. Yay, movie. So now I, I know some of you have seen this movie before. Some of you have probably seen this movie dozens of times, but I know a lot of, I'm hoping that some of you haven't seen this movie before. 
So this is a, a three minute, just three minutes long. Um, it's a streetcar ride. We're gonna be on a streetcar. We're gonna come from downtown Berkeley up to this part of town uh, where the Hillside Club. Uh, this is a movie from 1906. Um, so it's called A Trip to Berkeley. Now a few things about this movie. Uh, this movie was filmed in June of 1906. Now what happened in April of 1906? The earthquake and fire. So San Francisco was almost completely destroyed just two months before this. We are gonna be on a streetcar. It was the Oakland and Berkeley Rapid Transit Company. And we're going to be on uh, streetcar line number four. This line was built in 1901. So the 1898 pictures I've been showing you of Northside, that's three years before this streetcar line was built. It's a really, it's a really interesting little movie. Keep this picture in mind. So this is what would become Hearst Avenue. And we are looking east up into the hills. So this is the university over on the right side, and this is the north side um, area over here where uh, Veltfreden is. Just a couple signs of, civil, uh, of modern conveniences. There's this one electrical pole and another one, but it's this dirt road. So our streetcar is gonna be coming up the same street. It's gonna look very different. Um, it's gonna, this is one still from this frame. Uh, and you'll, amongst other things, you'll notice lots of electrical poles because uh, amongst other things, we need to be able to run the streetcar. Okay, I'm gonna stop this just for a sec. So we are on Oxford Street, looking north. We're right about where Berkeley Way tees into the university. So um, what's gonna happen is one block up, we're gonna to get to Hearst Street, we're gonna turn right, we're gonna go up all the way to Hearst, and then when we get to Euclid, we're gonna turn left. And that's our little three minute streetcar journey. This is what it looks like today. Just as, you know, did you bring you right into the 20th century? So this is the same view. This is a different streetcar which is gonna move in front of us. This man here is going to flip a switch. This, the streetcar is gonna go straight, and as soon as it passes, this man is gonna flip the switch so that we turn right instead. You see he's smoking a pipe. I love it, you can see his pipe smoke right now. I just love that. So uh, this streetcar is going north on Oxford. We're turning right onto Hearst. And then we're going to have to look at all the telephone poles. You can't see the wires, but there are lots of wires above there to run. This is University House, where the, the chancellor lives. That's still there, but you can't see it from this view anymore because there are lots of buildings in the way. I love this picket fence with a nice little gate. And we're gonna make this little jog. This is LeConte Street coming down the hill. All these houses burned down in the 1923 fire. And now you probably recognize the divided street of Hearst. Uh, horse and carriage. The cars and horse and carriages you're gonna see on the right were also probably hired for this film, I'm gonna guess. And this is the cheesiest part of this little movie. There's gonna be this staged altercation here. Uh, there's not supposed to be anybody walking on the track in front of the car, uh, but they're gonna stop the car and they're gonna get out and they're gonna, and you're gonna see a, this lady in white's gonna run over and she's gonna whack his head with a, her parasol. <laughs> but this is all staged for the camera. Here she comes. Whack, whack, whack. <laughs> Get off the tracks. Okay, and they all walk off, and they get back on the car, and we'll go. On. But you're gonna see here, you're gonna see two more cars here, and you're gonna see three more horse-drawn carriages. Yeah, yeah, lots of, lots of plants here, so that's, um, so the, these these carriages were likely all hired as as part of the part of the show here. So we're getting up close to Euclid, and we're going to be turning left up Euclid. This is the North Gate entrance of campus. I'm just going to stop here for a second, just to show you that 
the, the street such that it is, her street stops at this point. This is not a, a paved street yet. Um, it, it, it's hard to tell exactly what's here. But they're, they're clearly little planted areas that may be uh, uh, you know, just a, a dirt track, but it's not a fully graded street for cars and carriages yet. And here we are turning on Euclid. And that's the end of our little movie. You can saw there were, I think I heard the word orchard, there's, it's, it's very quaint, lots of old houses, fruit trees even, right at the corner of. Um, so this line continued up to Hillgard Street. Uh, and stopped, that's where it was. So this, this line was built in 1901, again, three years after our, uh, our, the pictures we've been looking at. So our, our, uh, our streetcar started about here, and we went a block this way, and then we turned right, and we came up Hearst, and this is where that silly altercation was, and we came up here to Euclid, and we turned left and came up to about here. And the streetcar continued along, Hillgard is about right here, just, just, just out off frame. That's where the streetcar line stopped. Um, but there were, to, by 1906, there would be a lot more houses in this picture. If, if we had the same picture in 1906, we would have seen a lot more development, a lot more evidence of modern, modern life. Well, back at the beginning, I was talking about Madge Robinson and her cohorts and um, why they started the club. And I told you they had a mission. And their mission concerned stupid white painted boxes. This is actually a quote, not uh, from Madge Robinson, but from Charles Keeler about houses. Um, and Charles Keeler, will be talking about him a lot in the next few minutes. Um, he was another mover and shaker at the time. He was probably involved in starting the club, or at least uh, encouraging the ladies to start the Hillside Club in 1898. But whenever... Charles Keeler, who worked in San Francisco, or Madge Robinson uh, on her trips, went to San Francisco. They saw scenes like this. This is a hillside in San Francisco, uh, a steep street with Victorian houses. Madge and Charles had definite opinions about Victorian houses on San Francisco's streets. They did not like them. And that's why Keeler called them stupid white painted boxes. Mad Robinson's mission in life for the Hillside Club was to prevent the Berkeley Hills from ending up looking like the San Francisco Hills. San Francisco had a, a regular square street grid, and they just laid that grid down on top of San Francisco, and if there happened to be a hill in the way, you just went up the hill, come hill or high water. They didn't think that Berkeley should look like this. They thought Berkeley should look like this. And if anybody knows where this picture was taken, please come see me afterwards. Um, and they thought Berkeley should look like this, and like this. And they thought that houses should look more like this. This is Charles Keeler's own house. It was built by Bernard Maybeck in 1895 up at Highland Place at the top of Ridge Road. Um, and there were a little clutch of houses that kind of looked like that, um, all built in the late 1890s. This, this Picture probably dates from a little later than that just because of the, the electricity. And this is Ridge Road here. And at the top there, that's Highland Place. Madge Robinson and her friends were successful. The early Hillside Club was successful in getting the Berkeley Hills to look more like this. They got policies instigated so when the hills were developed, instead of a street grid, a square street grid, streets curved around the contours of the hill. And if there was a tree in the way, you went around the tree. And if there were big rocks in the way, you went around the rocks. So if we go back to that picture of Cragmon and Marin and Spruce, they, they could have just put a, a square street grid here, but they didn't. You see Cragmon goes like this, and then it goes like this, and then it goes like this, and Spruce is curving around. They wanted the nature to be apparent. You went around these trees. There's a big rock outcropping up here, too. You went around that. So there's another big 
social trend that was happening at the same time. Arlene touched on this in her introduction. And this was something that influenced the club's rhetoric and it, inclu it influenced how people built houses and how the neighborhoods were formed. And it was the emerging environmental movement, although people didn't call it environmentalism at the time. But it was a big thing. So this is Charles Keeler here, and he, he, he was a social butterfly too. He loved hobnobbing with really famous people. And these are some really famous people. So this is John Muir, who founded the Sierra Club in 1892. And this is John Burroughs, who was also an environmental activist. This is William Keith, the painter. And this is Francis Brown. But what did you do in the early Sierra Club and when you were hanging out with people like John Muir and William Keefe and John Burroughs? You went hiking up in the mountains. That's what you did. You went and visited redwood trees. Some of you may recognize this man. He was also an important figure in the early environmental movement around here. This is Duncan McDuffie, whose name still lives on as part of Mason McDuffie Real Estate. Duncan McDuffie was a real estate developer, but he was also president of the Sierra Club on two different occasions in his early years. And he was also one of the founders of the East Bay Regional Park System, important man on all of this. And of course, there was the environmental president outdoorsman himself, Teddy Roosevelt. You remember he, he, he got to be president because William McKinley was shot and killed. And this famous picture at Glacier Point in Yosemite. The Hillside Club really drank all this up. They thought it was really important stuff. So the first important social thing that the Hillside Club did, um, in addition to putting pressure on the, the city to develop the, the hills in the way I've described, they built Old Hillside School. Uh, this is not the existing Old Hillside School that's up on Nut Hill. This is the Old, Old Hillside School. It was built in 1901, and there were rooms on the inside, but also these, this wonderful big porch. And that way, you could have classes on the inside, and you could have classes on the outside. Fresh air, exercise, does the body good. If we go back to our house we were looking at here, at the corner of Dirt Path and Dirt Path, the uh, Old Hill Site School was right here, at the corner of Virginia and Leroy. Um, unfortunately, it all, as you know, this whole area burned down in 1923. Uh, including Old Hillside School, including the original Hillside Clubhouse. In 1904, Charles Keeler wrote a book called The Simple Home because it wasn't enough just that you said what a house shouldn't be. So, okay, we'd, a house shouldn't be a stupid white painted box, but we had to say what a house was, and so Charles Keeler wrote this book. Uh, this is what The Simple Home is all about. And the first chapter in this book isn't about the house. The first chapter is about the garden. Now you might expect in a typical book about a house, the garden would be the last chapter. No, -uh. garden is the first chapter because that's the most important thing. Fresh air, sunshine. A couple of years later in 1906, our Hillside Club put out this pamphlet about guidelines on building your house. This way you just have this little pamphlet instead of reading Charles Keeler's whole book. Um, there's no byline on this pamphlet, but it was written by uh, Bernard and Annie Maybeck. And it's where we get our famous line that hillside architecture is landscape gardening around a few humes, a few rooms for use in case of rain. So what is your house? Your house is just something, some place where you don't get rained on. Um, but down here, I also say, choose a wide lot for your house. Do without something else, but don't come 15 miles and climb 600 feet to live on a slice of land next to your neighbor's fence. Now, when Maybeck is talking about coming 15 miles, he's talking about coming from San Francisco, because in 1906, what had just happened to San Francisco? It all burned down. There were a whole lot, one of the reasons Berkeley's population tripled in between 1900 and 1910 is that lots of people came to Berkeley. They got burned out of San Francisco, didn't want to have that happen again, and so they came to live in Berkeley. Um, and 
Climbing 600 feet means coming and living up in the hills. A few rooms in case of rain. So, did you sleep outside too? Damn straight you did. You slept in your sleeping porch because that's what you, your house has a sleeping porch. And lots of arts and crafts houses from this time were built with sleeping porches. This is Bernard Maybeck's own house. This also burned down in 1923. Um, and I think there were, if I remember correctly, there were four different sleeping porches in this house. There's one up here, and there's one here. There's probably some more around the back. So, what do you need a bedroom for? You, you put your mattress out here, you sleep. Fresh air. It's good for you. But fundamentally, what did people build clubs for, neighborhood clubs? They built it for community. They wanted to build a neighborhood. So this is the old Hillside Clubhouse. It was right here where you're sitting now. Again, burned down in 1923. The club first met at Veldvreden, the uh, Moody's house just up the hill uh, that you saw. Uh, they met there until 1901, and then when they built Hillside School, the Hillside Club met at, Hill, at, at the schoolhouse. And then when they built this, then they started meeting here. They had dinners, they had dances, music, good food, good drink. You built a community. And the idea was, I mean, the, the neighborhood was still growing, right? At, at the beginning, not many people lived here, but more and more came as, you know, every week there were more people coming to live. It gets dark early in the winter time. After dinner, but before bedtime, what are you gonna do? You need to entertain yourself. You come down to the club. The early hillsiders were really big into stage productions. So this is the earliest known photograph of a hillside club stage production. It's one of the early Christmas ceremonials. It's as good a quality picture as, as I can find. So this, this was you know, sometime between early 1920s. There was a fireplace with a fire you could come sit next to. Your neighborhood club wasn't necessarily always without a little side interest. Here's Madge Robinson again. Uh, and this is the San Francisco Call newspaper. Let's see, this is, this is also 1906, October of 1906. Um, and rather snobbily titled, <clears throat> News of the County, Counties Bordering San Francisco Bay. But why is Madge there with her big hat. Well, because strife, strife besets fashionable Berkeley. Oh my goodness. A row, a row has developed between factions of the fashionable Hillside Club over the invasion of portable houses and disruption of the club is imminent. I'm sure the ladies, society ladies of San Francisco had uh, great fun reading about Madge Robinson and uh, getting a little comeuppance. You know, old money always looks down its nose at new money. And we're, by the, you know, we're just a sleepy little backwater in the shadow of San Francisco after all. Um, but it's okay, the Hillside Club survived. The disruption of the club was not imminent. And there was even time for Madge and her husband, this is actually Madge and her husband and two friends, going off to the big game. You can see their, their cow go bears penance on their car and here, you know, all the people, they, they put the, you know, those warriors' flags on their cars they're driving around. People did that a hundred years ago. Picnics, the big game, go Bears. Well, I hope you've enjoyed um, our little tour of 1898. If you would like more information, uh, two books in particular I'd recommend, uh, Berkeley 1900 by Richard Schwartz. A uh, number of the pictures that you saw in this talk, I, I stole from his book. Um, and the other book is called Berkeley Bohemia. Now this, this talks about the, uh, the early Hillside Club goes a little later into the early 20th century, but it's great stories about, about community and, and the early part of Berkeley. So I'll just close that if you are new to the club, Please stay for dessert. As Arlene said, we've got chocolate, hot, strong hot chocolate and cookies. Um, please, if you see someone wearing a white name tag, they're a member here at the club, please talk. I hope you'll find that the 2018 version of the Hillside Club can offer you some community and some fresh air. So, thank you very much.
why don't, it'll just take a few minutes for a couple of questions, Christine. That's an excellent question. Does this building have the same exact floor plan as the original clubhouse? No, it doesn't. Um, the fireplace was up here and that was moved over to here. So um, this picture is also the picture on, as you exit the building is on the left. So if I'm not mistaken, this picture was taken from back there this way. Um, there was a, there wasn't a stage like this. As you saw that, there wasn't really a stage they had to make do with. It's just this little, this little area up uh, on top of a few steps. But um, no, it didn't really have the same. Uh, and one of the things they did, because they were such into dramatic productions, they made sure that the new clubhouse had a stage. Yeah, and so that's one reason the, the hearth was put off to the side. Um, there are early pictures of this building. There's one, I, the earliest one I know of is from about 1928, 1930, but it looks just like this. It, 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 the early pictures of this building don't look any different from modern pictures of this building. Yes. Thank you again to all the volunteers and to our speaker, our club historian, David Mostardi. Thank you. Thank you.